To the ancient Romans, the red glint of Mars evoked images of blood and battle. They named it after their god of war. But to us, in the 21st century, this same planet may hold something entirely different, a future. Mars formed about 4.5 billion years ago, when gas and dust swirling around our young sun coalesced to create the fourth planet from the center of our solar system. It's small, just a bit more than half the size of Earth, and its diameter is only slightly greater than the width of Africa. Yet the surface area of Mars? Roughly equal to all of Earth's continents combined. Its surface is rocky and dense, and deep beneath lies an iron, nickel, and sulfur-rich core. Billions of years ago, that core may have powered a magnetic field, shielding Mars the way Earth's magnetosphere protects us. But something happened. The field disappeared. The planet went silent. Above the core lies a mantle of silicate rock, and its outer crust is rich in iron. When even a whisper of oxygen meets that iron, rust forms, giving Mars its iconic red color. That rusty surface? It's not just pigment. It's a timeline. Long ago, Mars had flowing rivers, vast lakes, maybe even a northern ocean. The fingerprints of water still mark the landscape today. Dried riverbeds, sediment layers, and polar ice caps remind us of what once was. Volcanoes like Olympus Mons, three times the height of Everest, once roared to life. But by 50 million years ago, Mars volcanoes died out, just as Earth's dinosaurs faded into extinction. Mars today is dry, cold, and lifeless. But it wasn't always this way. So, how do we get to this ancient, frozen world? Well, let's clear up a myth. If you see Mars in the night sky and launch straight at it, you're not going to get there. Because by the time you arrive, Mars will have moved on. We don't aim where Mars is. We aim where Mars will be. This is called the minimum energy trajectory, a precise cosmic dance. We wait for Earth and Mars to align just right, which happens about every 26 months. Then, we fire our rockets, shut them off, and coast, floating nearly 300 million kilometers across the void. This journey takes roughly nine months. Now imagine a future where we don't have to wait years for alignments. If we had fuel depots in space, or better propulsion tech, we could burn our engines the whole time. That would give us artificial gravity and shorten the trip from months to mere weeks. But until then, we coast. Like throwing a baseball across a field and watching it curve with perfect precision. Except the field is space, and the ball is us. Let's say we make it. Boots on the red dust. What's next? Mars is not exactly cozy. Average temperatures dip to minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The air? Thin, 95% carbon dioxide. No breathable atmosphere, no magnetic shield, and dangerous radiation levels. But we adapt. We could begin with enclosed habitats, domes with pressurized, Earth-like atmospheres. Think of entire cities, sealed from the outside, warmed by solar panels, and protected by regolith shielding. Want to think bigger? Terraforming. Some scientists dream of heating up the planet, releasing CO2 trapped in the soil and polar caps to thicken the atmosphere and trigger a greenhouse effect. Warm the planet. Melt the ice. Maybe even bring water back. Others propose giant mirrors in orbit to direct sunlight, or introducing engineered microbes to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. Biotechnology, sculpting a world. Is it ambitious? Yes. Impossible? Not necessarily. Too early? For now. But if humanity wants a second home, Mars is the closest shot we've got. Mars is not just a dot in the night sky. It's a time capsule. A test. A challenge to our curiosity and ingenuity. To understand Mars is to ask, what went wrong? What can we learn? And can we go there, not just to visit, but to stay? Because one day, someone's great-grandchild might look at Earth through a telescope from the surface of Mars.